wonderful. Okay, hello everyone. Welcome uh, to another Wednesday evening. Um, we, the, so I'll get the bad news out of the way first. We're not going to be stargazing tonight, I'm afraid. Uh, the weather is too temperamental and we, uh, yeah, we just can't uh, guarantee to make it work. So we're going to have our cloudy backup evening consisting of a talk and then refreshments after the talk as a sort of consolation prize for a lack of stars. Uh, and then we're going to come in for a second talk provided by the CAA, which is going to be all about Edmund Halley and his comet, I assume. No, ju oh, just the guy, no comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we might mention the comments. Um, okay, so a tiny bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, so the uh, date for your diary is going to be Saturday the 18th of March, which is just over two weeks' time. That's when we have our big open day. You might have seen the poster for it on the door. Um, so right here in the department where you've come today, we're going to be open all afternoon from 2 till 6 p.m. on the Saturday. And there's going to be a whole schedule of astronomical talks and planetarium shows and games and activities. And uh, cafe is going to be running and all kinds of fun things. Um, and the PhD students are working hard to come up with fun things. They're coming up with the a, a distance ladder obstacle course. Uh, so we're going to be jumping up and down doing fun things. We've got artists. Um, we will guide, guide, guide children through making nice pictures of the sun. Uh, we've got sort of make and do activities. We've got the Whipple Museum coming down and making uh, orreries. All kinds of really fun things. So completely free, no need to book. Saturday the 18th of March, come here for more astronomy. All the details are on our website. Um, so, okay, I think all that is left is for me to hand over to our headline speaker. So I'm here with uh, Shikara Astana, who is going to be telling us all how to build a universe. Uh, so over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming to attend the talk on a very cloudy evening. And thank you for organizing, I think, Matt left. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, as the title suggests, The Hitchhiker's Guide to Building a Universe. So in the next 20, 25 minutes, what my aim is that at the end of this talk, everyone here can figure out what are the basic steps on how you can build your own universe on a computer, given you have a large enough computer, obviously. But the title kind of is based on the book by Douglas Adam, which was The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a hilarious book if you haven't read it yet, but I think the premise of the talk kind of goes along the same way. So before we actually begin, I would like to still prove that we can actually do something like that. So we'll play a little game, which is something that everyone does at some point of time, which is can you spot the difference? But in this case, we will not actually do it with identical images. We'll use two different galaxies uh, that have been shown on the slide. One of them is actually from the Hubble Space Telescope, and the other one is built on a computer. So what we have to see is, can anyone guess which one is the actual image and which was based on the computer? Go for it. That is actually correct. The left side is the Hubble Space Telescope. But the point is that these images are looking extremely identical, which means that our models are starting to make uh, objects that can, can resemble the actual universe. So. That is actually real and simulated, and this is from NGC 4414, which is the Hubble Space Telescope image. Very high res, it's very clear, you can see individual points there. But our simulations, which is done by something called FIRE, also manages to replicate a very, very nice looking galaxy. And that's completely made on a supercomputer. And we'll get to that in later parts of the slide. So, considering that we now know that things can be made, what are the principles behind it? And I believe I can summarize it in three points. If you know three things in physics, you can build your own things. The first one is gravity. So gravity, as everyone might know, is a force of attraction. If you have mass, you have gravity. Everyone will attract everyone else, no matter how small you are, how big you are. As long as you have mass, you have gravity. So a small cartoon representation of that is from the Roadrunner and Coyote, which was really famous when I was growing up. So you can see that as the coyote runs off the cliff, gravity pulls him down, and he falls right to the ground. Uh, for a more scientific view, we have our own solar system, which is comprised of the sun and the planets moving around the sun. And because the sun is part of the Milky Way galaxy, it is also kind of revolving around the entire galaxy. So what actually happens is that the sun is moving in across the galaxy, and all the planets are kind of getting pulled with it. And this is basically what gravity does. It just pulls everything together. 
And once you know gravity, you're one third done. The next part is hydrodynamics. So forgetting the jargon altogether, hydrodynamics is basically a flow of fluids and how to study that flow. And one important fact is that gas is also sort of a fluid. Now for, as an example, you have this image of a bird flapping its wings. And you can see that the air around the bird is kind of moving across. And that, how that air moves and what it does is basically what we are trying to model and study. We also have different examples, such as a ball going through a laminar flow. And you can see as the ball moves, the air kind of swings across it. And finally, there's an image of a turbine rotating, and you can see that the water is kind of flowing through. And all of this study of how these fluids move uh, in different scenarios come under the field of hydrodynamics. But the only thing that you should take away from all of this is that we need to understand how fluids move. And once you do that, that's two things done, gravity and hydrodynamics. And finally, we have something called baryons. Now, <clears throat> again, ignoring the jargon altogether, Baryons is basically everything that visible matter is made of. So you, me, the table, computer, projector, all baryons. And because everything has properties, so does baryons. And while they have a lot of different properties, we'll ignore everything. It, it's irrelevant to what we want to achieve by the end of this talk, but the only point is that it does make up all the visible matter in the universe. And considering I'm using visible matter, they must also be things that we can't see which, as astronomers go, we call them dark matter because our creativity in naming things is absolutely incredible. <laughs> so, uh, as the name suggests, it is dark. So it's not made up of stars or planets. Uh, it's not made up of baryons, obviously, otherwise it will be visible. It's not made up of antimatter, and it's certainly not made up of large black holes. And that is the extent of all the information we have about these objects, or objects or not an objects. All we know, it exists. And the way we know it exists is you can see through this image of the Pandora's cluster. So all these points on this square grid are basically stars, galaxies. And the red area that is marked is just hot gas in the universe. But what we don't see and what we think exists is all shaded in blue, which is what the dark matter distribution might look like. Now, the reason we think it exists is because the mass of the of the objects that are shown in the optical are not enough to gravitationally bound each other. So we need more stuff. Now the fact that we can't see this stuff is the reason we call it dark matter. And this is how the distribution might look like. So fantastic, we have all three things that we require to make a universe, gravity, hydrodynamics, and baryonic physics. But as you can see, there's one other tiny problem, uh, which is the requirement of a supercomputer. So basically, all of these physical theories are easy to write, and but really difficult to solve, especially if you have a really, really large number of equations for different particles. So if you have, if you have a supercomputer, then you're done. You can make your own universe, and that's what we're going to do for the rest of this talk. We are going to try and build one live during the next five, 10 minutes. So step one. As we saw, we have three pillars, gravity, hydrodynamics, and baryons. Step one is gravity. So what we're going to do here is just assume we have two particles, and the only thing that exists is gravity. So they'll attract each other, and they'll start going around and around and around. But we don't have to stop at two. What if we have more? For example, if you have five particles, they'll all interact with each other. They'll make some sort of a trajectory based on how massive they are, what their initial velocities were, and so forth. But again, we can even go one step ahead, we can have 10 or even 20 particles. And you can see it becomes more and more chaotic the more number of particles that exist. So if you just have gravity, this is what will happen. But we don't really have to stop there. We can go to 100, 10, 1,000, million, billion particles. Unfortunately, my laptop can only do 20, so that's all we can see here. But we have the ability to go much higher than that. And again, given astronomers' naming convention, we very rightly call these n-body simulation because they are n bodies in these simulations. <clears throat> yeah, I, I can't help with it, but I like the name, so it's really, I'm one to blame as well. But as you might have seen, in this, all of these simulations, I've never really pointed out what these objects are. So gravity doesn't really care what the object is. It could be a ball, it could be 
the carpet, it could be anything, as long as you know the mass and basically where it's located and its uh, velocity, you're set. Gravity can do its thing. So for our simulations, what these objects that we have seen here, we'll call them dark matter halos. And the reason we do that, I'll explain at the end. But again, this is just for these simulations, all these small points that we see are actually really, really, really massive uh, structures of the universe. And the only thing that we have to assign is the location of where these particles are at the start of the simulation. <clears throat> so that's the question we want to answer. Where do you put them? So while we are still on the topic of gravity, we are going to take one step back and define what the initial conditions are. Basically, where these small objects are in our entire structure that we are simulating. And for that, we have to use something known as the cosmic microwave background. This is essentially just a relic of the Big Bang theories of the Big Bang. And this is basically a sky signature that you can see anywhere across the sky if you had the ability to look in the microwave. Unfortunately, we can only do optical, so we can't really see this without a telescope. But essentially, if you could, this is how it would look like. Uh, and the only reason we need this is because we need certain cosmological parameters that in the end give us the distribution of our initial particles across the simulation volume. And once we have that distribution, we can go back to our building the, the universe of sorts. But before we add step two and step three, which is hydrodynamics and baryons, there are a few examples of these certain simulations. One of them is called the Millennium Simulation. And this is basically about 10 to the power 21 kilometers in size. I don't really know how to scale that down, but that's 21 zeros across the entire volume. And this was done on a massive computer. And basically, we can start to see these very nice filamentary structures. And that's essentially what our universe might look like on a really large scale. Does that work? Yeah, solid. So this is, this is basically how the universe might look like on a really, really large scale. So these gravitationally, just, just by gravity, we can still manage to reproduce something that might resemble what our universe might look like. But we don't really have to go this large. We can even go for a much smaller galactic level uh, simulations in which, as you can see, the size is only about 20 kiloparsecs, which is sort of a scale of a galaxy. But again, we are just simulating dark matter halos. So there's no baryons in this simulations yet. And the reason why dark matters play an important role is because all the baryons kind of feed into the dark matter. And that's where all the process, star formation, making galaxies kind of occur. So we need the backbone of the universe, which is basically what dark matter does. And then eventually we'll start populating it with baryons. So one question you can ask is, why are these simulations even important? Gravity in itself is not physics. We have a lot more other stuff. But even through just this basic assumptions, we managed to learn a lot about how these dark matters are distributed and what they might look like. OK, so that's step one. Step two is adding the baryons and modeling with hydrodynamics. Unfortunately, we can't separate the two because as soon as you have baryons, you need some way to map them. And that's through uh, fluid uh, mechanics, which is hydrodynamics. So. Uh, Again, we need visible matter, which is basically baryons. And once we have those dark matter halos that I showed previously and we put baryons in it, we can do really cool stuff, which is what one of these simulations managed to do, which is called Illustrious. It was done about a few years ago. So on the left here is basically just the dark matter distribution and how as time progresses after the Big Bang, you're able to make more and more structure. But because now we have baryons and hydrodynamics in it, we can actually see the temperatures changing. We can see galaxies being formed in the middle, how different stuff like AGNs and quasars burst to give us more and more energy, which creates different sort of structures. And we, in the end, get this sort of filamentary uh, map, essentially, which is, one second, I can just play it again. So basically, the filamentary map that what our universe sort of looks like. And we are all able to do this just by using those three things, hydrodynamics, gravity, and baryons. And you run it with a supercomputer with the right equations, and you are able to reproduce a large chunk of what the universe might look like. But again, we don't really have to go that large. We can do the same thing for an individual galaxy. 
and we can see the galaxy being formed. So basically, uh, as time progresses, we have the central galaxies and there are other galaxies that kind of flow in, they interact with each other, there's galaxy clusters that basically come in, and uh, you can see different, because we have a simulation and we control everything, we can see different types of uh, vantage points of view and different quantities as well. But just from the gas density, we can see uh, different galaxies coming in, and essentially this is what looks like in the optical. And once it stops, uh, the final result is a galaxy that resembles our own, the Milky Way. And doing this helps us to figure out a few other things, such as well, it got stuck, so we're not figuring out anything. One second. Maybe after we see this again. It looks cool, so we can do that. Uh, but yeah, essentially this looks like the Milky Way after starting off as a very, very small dwarf galaxy, and then just by merging, we can get more and more stuff out of it. Let's hope it now works. Apparently not. Sorry, one second. is refusing to play. Awesome. So basically through these small simulations, you can learn more about how galaxies are formed, what their clustering is, and some other properties. So this is basically everything that you need to build your own universe. And once you have that, you can start playing around with it. Because in the end, you're in control of everything. except my own computer. <laughs> okay, hopefully now it works perfectly well. So uh, again, we'll ignore all the jargon, but the whole point is because we control the whole simulations and our own uh, equations that we use, we can play around randomly with different sort of uh, properties of these basic dark matter halos. We can have different sort, cold dark matter, warm dark matter. It doesn't matter. The point is we control everything. We can go forward in time, backward in time. We can see what happens at the start of our simulation, at the end. We can go ahead in our simulations to see what the future might look like, which is basically why we do these simulations, because we control the entire structure that we want to work with. And using that, we can basically study everything we want. But as everything goes, it's not perfect. As you might have realized, I have never really spoken about radiation. So radiation is essentially just light. So basically th things that are coming out from the light bulb, uh, the screen of my monitor, everything is radiation. And if you don't have radiation, the problem there are a few problems in cosmology as well as this uh, whole universe building that you cannot really study very well. One of them is called the epoch of reionization, which uh, happened about a billion years after the Big Bang. And if you don't have proper models of these uh, radiation, you can't really study it. But even except of that, there are other problems that might come up. You need to have really, really good uh, computational techniques to be able to solve all of these equations. Uh, you also have a problem of resources. Uh, baryonic matter requires very precise measurements of its properties. and Eventually, if you don't model everything prop properly, you can have convergence problems. It can produce nonsense results. It can produce really bad results. And it can produce garbage results. And sometimes it produces the right ones, which is what we like. But at the end, uh, it's still doing a pretty good job. So you have these set of simulations in uh, a basic summary of them. And using, depending on what you like to study, you can do a lot of different things. So example, for if you only have n-body simulations, you can study uh, the entire universe. You can even study galactic structures, uh, Milky Ways, uh, just one segment of the Milky Way or something that looks like a Milky Way. If you add baryons, you can start making more and more galaxies. And this is the original simulation that we had in the first slide. It makes a lot more nicer looking galaxies at the end of it. And you also have a lot of other things going on. So Massive Black have a, a bit of black hole physics that are really nice. AGN is another sort of uh, structure in the universe and you can 
basically do a lot of different things. But all you need is gravity, hydrodynamics, and baryons, and you're done. You can make your own little version of a simulation. And uh, yeah, I think with that, hopefully, if someone asks you if it's possible to build one, you can maybe explain uh, that, yeah, it's pretty easy. You just need three things. And with that, uh, I think I'm done. Thank you all for listening. So there won't be a place for baryons to actually, uh, basically you need baryons inside the dark matter, that's where they all cluster together. And if they don't cluster, you won't have any structure. So you won't have any stars, you won't have any galaxies, they'll just float around. So basically it's just potential well. So, it's, so just think of it as a big blanket, big bowl to hold the soup in. Okay, so you don't get, you don't get the, the baryonic matter to start to coalesce itself on that kind of scale and form structures on its own? Uh, it also needs to cool down, which helps when it's in a potential well. So it, there might be structure formation, but it won't look as it does uh, in an actual universe. Yeah, question at the top. Perfect. Yes, everything, uh, all atoms are made up of baryons. It's basically protons and neutrons. We know for sure, but in the 1960s, it was first predicted, and then it was found out later by actually testing it. So we, we completely know everything about, not everything, a lot of things about the CMB. <laughs> ah, kiloparsec. So that's just the unit of measurement because the scales that we work with are really large. So if you start using kilometers, then we'll have 10 to the power 16 kilometers, 10 to the power 18. So one kiloparsec is about 10 to the power 16. Uh, kilometers. Thanks. So the night sky, the stars that we are seeing is just our Milky Way, but the filamentary structures happen on scales that are much, much more massive. So we don't really have the line of sight to see all of it because it scales down really, really large. So some of them are voids where they have very few amount of gas. Others, between the structures itself, there's also a lot of gas present, which, and it's all, it doesn't completely clump down inside like four pockets. It, there's, a, there's a whole network that goes through. But essentially you have really, really large pockets and then there's stuff in the middle, but it's essentially just gas. Uh, so in the original initial conditions, Okay, I don't know how far I have to go back. Uh, so basically the initial conditions which define how we make our structure, the location of different parts in the beginning of our simulation before gravity starts, and the cosmological solutions for that, that's where dark energy comes in. But after that, it's fine, it, because after it expands really rapidly, matter and radiation take over. To be fair, I don't think anyone knows anything about dark energy that much. Really, really. Was, the radio commentator obviously didn't understand what he was saying. Yes, I think they got that one wrong. Yeah. <laughs> the, current, the current theory is that space has its own energy, which kind of propagates everything outwards. But again, it's a whole, it's a whole black box. It's, it's quite literally a black box at this point. No one really knows. What happens at the end of a galaxy life cycle? Well, I guess it's all the stars that make up a galaxy. So as the stars kind of burn out, they all have their own life cycles depending on the size of the star. So eventually all the stars, maybe like our sun, will go into a red giant and then finally become a white dwarf. But if after enough time, I think all the stars will end their life cycle and you might have a really dark region of space, which does not produce a lot of light. Uh, but that is my best guess. Mm -hmm. 
No, so black holes are basically the remnants of a star. And essentially, if you have a lot of stars in a specific formation, you get a galaxy. And each individual star has their own life cycle. And depending on how big the star is, it can mo form a black hole or it can form something else. So a really large, massive black hole the size of a galaxy would not be possible. It'll just be individual stars. It's probably worth saying as well. So galaxy astronomers sometimes use a dead galaxy in a really specific way that mm -hmm. I think cosmologists don't. So for, for kind of galactic astronomers, making new stars is what makes a galaxy sort of alive. And then we talk about dead galaxies that are no longer making stars. So they're not dead galaxies from the point of view of someone like Shaker who does these sort of simulations. But if you're observing galaxies and you see one of these, what we call them red dead giant galaxies that are sitting there not making new stars, sometimes galaxy astronomers will call that a dead galaxy. Um, but yeah, it's not dead in the sense that you were saying. Yeah. So it's worth saying, I think, with the James Webb Telescope, you've not talked recently about these dead galaxies and findings throughout the universe. So it can be a bit confusing. Yeah. Do you know when the final galaxy is rotating? So it's basically how they're formed. So they're just conserving angular momentum. So when they're forming, all this gas kind of swirls around, and essentially the stars that are forming also kind of rotate, and it's just it's just the whole balance that causes it to kind of go around the basic center of the galaxy. Yes. Is it possible to simulate one part of the university rather than the whole Yes, you can do... Uh, you can do these smaller simulations that are on the top right, which is just basically just one galaxy, but you can also scale it a little bigger, so you'll have multiple galaxies. If you make it bigger, you can just have like one region, one small region of space. Depending on what your needs are, you can make simulations of different sizes. Yes, so, so when you do these simulations, uh, they always have some sort of an edge. So because the universe is isotropic and homogeneous, we kind of assume a uniform uh, background that comes in from the sides of these boxes. And that kind of mimic what the rest of the universe might be impacting that specific volume. So that's also, there's a lot of free parameters there when you model it, but essentially that's what happens. So once you have these simulations, you can make different observational predictions. And there's a lot of observational data that is available. So for example, uh, if you have a galactic structure and you try to see what the flux might be through that object, you can measure that in our uh, from our simulations and then just compare it to observations. And if it matches, that means you're doing a good job. But there's always, uh, sometimes a lot of observations end up matching, but the others don't. And that's why the simulations kind of keep going in different directions. That's why there's so many of them, because they're not really converging on every single ob uh, observation that we have. So if you have some of them which are suited for more different observations, but we don't have one simulation that can do everything yet. Depends on the resources. It can take a few hours. It can take a few days. It can even take a few minutes. So it depends on how much resources you have. Yes, so uh, in these cases, sorry. So in this case, you start off somewhere, and then you see the evolution forward. But you can always go the other way around, because in the end, we have all this data. We just process it from left to right. If you do right to left, you can see it backwards. And you can make, I don't know, capture what we have now in real world, and play back and see what was the configuration, even in your world. Yes, you can. But the thing is, the way you do simulations, you start from an initial condition. You kind of give that as an input, and then you run it forward. So if you run it back, you're going to get what you started with which you already know because you fed it into the system. <laughs> oh, so you start with the galaxies and then you kind of go backwards. Oh, that's, I think that's a little too tedious. Uh, <laughs> I think that might, I, I don't know if it's possible or not. I have no idea about that. But it seems interesting. Yeah. Okay, uh, two more questions. Do you and you, then we'll... Festival. 
So it's essentially just a bunch of galaxies clumped together that makes up a galaxy cluster. So that's how just the terminology if you use. So if you have like five apples in a bowl, it just, it just says half a dozen apples, sorry, six apples. But yeah, half a dozen apples. Uh, but it just... Stronger approximation. Yeah, approximately. Six, five, same thing. 100 is also same. Uh, but yeah, so it's just nomenclature. That's a good question. Uh, considering what we know about dark energy so far was that it caused rapid expansion. It's also kind of expanding things right now. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah. May, I have no idea. It's really hard to answer. These questions which have the form like, what would the universe look like if the laws of physics were different? It's always yeah. Like, uh, it's kind of hard to answer. Um, well, thank you so much uh, to Shikha for his wonderful talk. Um, there will be a tea break now, so for about 10 minutes there'll be tea and biscuits, and then we'll come back in for a second talk from the CAA all about Edmund Halley. So can we thank our speaker? <laughs>